Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. And again today, I'm continuing a teaching through a series that I've entitled Killing Sacred Cows. You know, the it's kind of a whimsical title, and I've got a picture here of a cow with a wooden leg and a chef chasing it. I gave the story about why I put that on there. But really what this is, it's a teaching about the goodness of God. And I'm talking about how that God loves us and we say this, but you know, the scripture says Jesus was the one speaking in Mark 7, uh, 13. And he says, you make the word of God of no effect through your traditions and doctrines of men and such like things that you've done. And we say that we believe that God is a good God and that God loves us. And yet we have these religious doctrines that just cancel the power that's in that. If we really understood the goodness of God without any religious baggage that held us back, I guarantee you all of your problems would be over. You know, I had a Bible college student just uh, last week that came to me and um, anyway, long story, but I just got to saying that, you know what, you're, you're too focused on yourself. You're too critical of yourself. If you knew how much God loved you, everything would be over. And it just shocked them. And anyway, long story, but I prayed with them through the ministry that day. I mean, they were just transformed and their problems didn't change. It was the way that they understood things. Once you understand how much God loves you, Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. When you understand the love of God, it just solves your problems. It really does. And I know that there's people watching this program right now that you've got serious problems. You've got, you know, marriage problems, relational problems with your kids or with coworkers. You've got healing problems. You've got financial problems. You've got all of these things. But if you understood how much God loved you, it would just take care of it. You know, I could give you so many examples of this. I think I already gave one example about uh, when I was praying and saying, God, I'd give my right arm to feed Jamie to take care of my wife. And the Lord spoke to me, Luke uh, 12, 32, where he says, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And when God revealed his love to me that day, God, there was a breakthrough that happened. I remember another time that back in the beginning of our ministry that we were just so poor and we were struggling to get our bills paid and to stay on the radio and to do what God called us to do. And I had a dream. And in this dream, God just showed me, revealed to me his love. And I woke up and none of my circumstances had changed, but I had changed on the inside. And I'm telling you, this is what I'm trying to get across. God is a good God. God loves you. But we have these religious traditions that say, oh yeah, he loves me when I'm worth loving when I'm lovely. But I want you to know that God loves you because He is love, not because you are lovely. This is what I was sharing yesterday out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You aren't saved by grace alone, and you aren't saved by faith alone. Now, sometimes we'll say that, and I even point it out in verse 5. This is Ephesians 2, 5. There's a parenthetical phrase at the end of the verse that says, by grace, you're saved. So right here in the very context, it says you're saved by grace. It's not completely wrong to say you're saved by grace, but it's wrong if you just put a period there and say it's nothing but God's grace that saves you. And there are some people that have done this. There are some people that try and separate grace and faith, and they say it's just totally up to God. It is just totally God's grace. You have nothing, zippo, zilch, nada to do with the things of God. That's wrong. That is not true. And then there's other people that try and separate it and say it's all about faith. It's about what you've got to do. That's not true. There has to be a combination of these two things. Did you know that sodium is poison. If you take enough sodium, it'll kill you. If you take enough chloride in your body, it will kill you. But if you mix it together in the right amounts and make sodium chloride, it makes salt and you'll die without it. Did you know that grace by itself, if all you do is emphasize its grace, it's up to God, it is not up to us. And if that's all you do, and if you don't put it into its proper balance with faith, 
Grace will kill you. And the same thing is true of faith. If all you do is talk about faith and you are just all a faith person, but you don't understand that faith doesn't move God. Faith just appropriates what God's grace has already provided. <laughs> Man, that is a huge statement right there. It took me, I don't know, decades to figure that out and get to where I could say that, but that's huge. Faith doesn't move God. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. If you don't mix these two things together, taken by themselves, it's poison. It'll kill you. I have seen people that God hold of truths about faith, about how we can confess the Word of God, how we can take our authority, how we can resist the devil, how we can pray and intercede and do all of these things. And they take these things about what our response is, that's faith, and they emphasize that, but they think that by doing this, they are moving God, that somehow or another God is responding to what they've done. And I've seen that literally just kill people. I mean, kill them emotionally. Uh, they get worn out. You know, in the church that I grew up in, it was a Baptist church. We used to use this little phrase or this little poem. It says, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep, but it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. And you could tailor make that to any group. You know, you know, that say that, you know, you just get so busy trying to do all of these things and earning God's blessing that it just wears you out. And I've seen many people just totally worn out. They've done everything that they know. But the thing that was wrong was they thought that if they would do this, then God was obligated to do that. And see, God is not responding to us. True faith is just a positive response on our part to what God has already done by grace. Faith, it's really incorrect to say that you're saved by faith alone. It's not incorrect to say that you're saved by faith if you put it into its context and understand that that faith is just reaching out and taking the salvation that Jesus has made available. That's not wrong. But technically, you aren't saved by faith alone you are saved by grace through faith. Your faith doesn't make God do anything. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. And there's a balance between these two. This is the reason I have this book entitled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith. You know, the guy who's our media buyer for us, he's been around the faith message a long time and stuff. And anyway, he's told me that this is actually the signature teaching of our ministry. Now, I teach on a lot of different things, but he says this is the core of it. This is what it's doing. I'm kind of bringing the grace group and the faith group together, or building a bridge between them. And it's the balance of grace and faith. You can get out of balance on either side. You know, out where I live, we have dirt roads. They aren't even paved roads. I'm way out in the country. And for drainage, they have a ditch on each side of the road. And, you know, especially like when it's snowy or something and the road is slippery, if you start sliding towards one ditch, there is a tendency to overcorrect and to pull it so far to the other side. And you know what? There's a ditch on that side, too. If you want to reach your destination, you can't just avoid this one ditch over here. You got to avoid both ditches. You got to go down the middle, a balance between those two things. And likewise, there are people that get into a ditch over here with the grace of God or a ditch over here about the faith of God. I'm not against either. They're both powerful, important things, but they've got to be balanced. You got to go right down the middle and live in a balance between grace and faith. And see, this just set me free because I was raised in a group that it was basically you do this and you make God do these things. God responds to us. That is not what the Bible calls faith. That's what the Bible calls works. And God will not be manipulated, controlled, forced into doing anything. You don't need to do it because He is such a good God. He's already anticipated every problem that we could ever have. He's already created the supply before you ever had the need 
before you ever sinned. He had already died for your sins. Forgiveness, everything that you will ever need, healing, prosperity, joy, peace, direction, wisdom, anything that you will ever need was already provided by grace before you ever had the need. And you don't have to do something to get God to respond to you. All you got to do is rest in faith and just by faith respond to what you believe God has already provided. Boy, that is huge, what I'm saying. And then there's people, see, that take the grace of God to such a degree that, well, it's just up to God. It's not you earning anything. They've got a partial revelation, and those people have been touched and set free from this performance-based relationship with God, and they take it to such an extreme that basically it doesn't matter what you do. It's just all the grace of God. That's not true. See, there's a ditch on both sides of this road. You got to go down the middle. Let me show you a passage over here in Titus chapter 2. And in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Well, what a radical statement. If, all you, if you were to say that you are saved by grace alone, it doesn't matter what you do. It's just totally God's grace. Again, I go back to Ephesians 2, 5. It says, by grace are you saved. That's not wrong to, to emphasize that it's the grace of God that provided salvation, but it's wrong if you say you're saved by grace alone, period. That's wrong. Because God's grace that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. If grace alone saved, then every person would be saved because God's grace has appeared unto all men. Did you know that Hitler had God's grace cover his sins? God died for the sins of Hitler. As far as we know, Hitler never responded to what God did in faith. He might have, you know, I, I've heard that he claimed to be a Christian, but th there's no evidence of it in his life. And as far as we know, he never repented uh, before his death. And so, uh, I don't believe that he appropriated that salvation, but God made provision for him. It says, His grace of God to bring salvation hath appeared to all men. That includes Hitler. That includes Mussolini. That includes anybody you want to mention, Genghis Khan, anybody in history who is notorious for their barbarism and the things that they've done. Jesus died for them. Jesus paid for their sins. And if grace alone saved, then all men would be saved because the grace that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, you are saved by grace through faith. Grace alone doesn't save. It's grace, what God has done for you, independent of you, before you existed, before your need existed. Grace had already made the provision, but faith is your part. Faith is not something you do to get God to move. See, if, that's, if that was what you are thinking, then it's not grace anymore because it's based on you. And the definition of grace, again, you can go into multiple definitions, but it's, at its core, it's simply unearned, undeserved um, favor of God, our blessing of God, healing, deliverance, prosperity, whatever. It has to be unearned, undeserved. It has to be independent of you. If there's something you do to qualify for grace through your effort, through some holiness, through some goodness, then it's not grace anymore. You know, over in Romans chapter 11 and verse 6, let me just turn over and read this. It says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. That's kind of wordy, but you know what this is saying? It's either grace or works. It's either what God did for you independent of you without your effort, or it's your effort independent of God's grace. But you can't mix your effort and God's grace. If God does it by grace, then that means that it had zippo, zilch, nada, zero to do with you. Again, I go back to a verse that I used yesterday in John chapter 1, verse 17. It says, grace and truth came through Jesus. That was 2,000 years ago. Jesus died for your sins 2,000 years ago. If you need to be born again today, Jesus is not going to come down to this earth, inhabit a physical body, be crucified, 
beaten with whips, buried, resurrected, and die for you. He's already done it. That's grace. It's already done. It was independent of you. It was completely separate from you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't even exist. How in the world could you think that you have to somehow or another do something to make God have grace towards you? Grace is independent of you. It has zippo, not a zilch, zero to do with you. Nothing. You don't earn the grace of God. But does grace alone do everything? See, there's some people that have seen the truth that I'm talking about and emphasizing, and from this, they just say, well, I didn't do anything. God loved me because He is love, not because I'm lovely. He provided these things, and so, man, I'm just, yeah, I'm home free. It doesn't matter what I do. That's not right. You don't do anything to earn God's grace. It's grace. It's independent of you. It's not earned. It's not deserved. But you do have to respond to God's grace. Again, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. God's grace paid for the sins of the entire human race, not just those who he knew would accept him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus has died for the sins of the entire human race. They are all paid for, but is everybody saved? Absolutely not. Jesus said there would be more that enter by the broad gate unto destruction than by the narrow gate unto everlasting life, and that relatively few people would be saved, but not because their sins weren't paid for. The grace of God that brings salvation has paid for the sins of the entire human race, but not everybody's saved because not everybody responds to what God has already done by grace. See, there has to be this balance between grace and faith. You can't just say it's all up to God. In a sense, it's up to God to initiate it. It's up to God to start it. It's up to God to provide it. And he did all of those things independent of us. But does that mean that we have nothing to do? No, we have to respond to God's grace. And that's what the Bible calls faith. The Bible does not call doing certain things, trying to get God to do something. That's not faith. The Bible says that faith is your positive response to God's grace. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. If God hasn't already provided it, then your faith can't make it happen. That's a mouthful. That's, that's huge what I just said. And I know that there's people all over the world today that you know God exists, you know that He has the power to solve your situation, and so you are trying to do something to get God to release His power into your life. And you think that that's faith. That's not faith. That's actually what the Bible calls works. It's what the Bible calls legalism. And God is not going to respond to you. You can't make God move in your life. You can't take the Word of God and just somehow or another twist the arm of God and say, I'm going to confess something 500 times. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pay my tithes. I'm going to do this. And now you, God, have to move. That is totally wrong. And that's the reason that you aren't seeing the blessing of God manifest in your life because that's not Bible faith. That's what the Bible calls works. And the book of Romans, especially Romans chapter 3 and many other places, just talk about that this, you know, the only thing that really is offensive to God, I mean, this is a huge statement, and some of you will probably choke on what I'm saying, but he went into the home of uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, these people that he called hypocrites. You know what? He, he loved people. He went into the publicans' homes. He went in. He ministered to the prostitutes, to the people that were rejected by society. Sins, the big sins that the religious world talks about, were not that big of a thing with Jesus because by grace, He had already come. He had dealt with those things. But you know the things that Jesus could not tolerate was the sin of self-righteousness, the sin of thinking that I don't need a Savior. I'm holy. God, I'm good enough that God's going to respond to me. 
Those are the people that God just unleashed His wrath upon. Jesus made a whip and drove the money changers out of the temple and stuff like this. He, the, in Mar Matthew chapter 23, boy, he spent an entire chapter saying, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you're whited sepulchers. The sin that God cannot tolerate is not homosexuality, adultery, and on and on and on. You could go, all of those things are bad, but the thing that God cannot tolerate is the person who says, God, I don't need you. I am holy, and I have done this, and now you have to respond to me. That's the sin that God cannot tolerate. The sin, you know, like in the parable of the uh, publican, and the Pharisee, and they both went to pray at the temple at the same time. And the Pharisee said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and I do all of these things. And, oh, you've got to be pleased with me. He wasn't going through a Savior. He was his own Savior. His faith was in himself. He was really taken with who he was. In contrast to that, Jesus said that there was a public and a man who was a liar, a thief, a traitor to the Jewish nation that collaborated with the Romans. And this man, he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He just smote his breast and he said, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This guy, you know, if you were to just evaluate their holiness, the Pharisee was much holier. He was living a much better life, but he was trusting in himself. He was arrogant. He was proud. This other person was murdering, lying, stealing. He was a traitor to his nation. He was all of these things, and yet God showed mercy. And he said that the publican was the one who went down justified, not the Pharisee. The thing that God can't tolerate is this self-righteousness to where you are trusting in your goodness. And when you sit there, you know, if let me say some things here. I pray that You'll understand, I'm saying this in love. It may sound really hard, but it's all true. But if you are mad at God, like, God, I did this, and I prayed, and I believed, and you didn't do this, and you're mad at God, you have exalted your goodness above God's goodness. You're saying, I'm holier than you, God. I'm more righteous than you. You failed. I didn't fail. You failed. That's that self-righteousness. God can't tolerate that. And it all comes because you think that you have fulfilled the requirements. You did this, and now, God, why didn't you respond? The reason he didn't respond is because you weren't trusting in a Savior. You were trusting in yourself. If you got what you deserved, if he was to respond to you the way that you deserve, you'd go to hell because all of us are still coming short of the glory of God. If we got what we deserved, we'd go to hell. Praise God for grace and understanding that faith is not something I do where I force God into doing something, but faith is just simply my positive response to what God has already done by grace. You know, I'm out of time today, but man, I'm just getting to some good things. I've got this book entitled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith. It'll go into a lot more detail. I've got CDs and DVDs that cover... Uh, this subject that I'm talking about here uh, in this series entitled Killing Sacred Cows.